A sleek, modern jet airliner, a common sight today on thousands of the world's air routes. But this jetliner was different. It was the first jet transport to fly in North America. The story of the original jetliner began in 1945, when the Victory Aircraft plant at Malton, Ontario was reorganized as AV Row Canada. During the war, the Victory plant had built Lancaster bombers, but now the new Avro company, with a talented design team headed by James Floyd, set out to build an all-jet airliner to Trans-Canada Airlines specifications. The company was actively encouraged and supported by the federal government, especially Transport Minister the Honorable C.D. Howe. The future looked bright, both for the company and for Canada, which could have become a world leader in civil aviation design and development. James Floyd, the man most responsible for the design and building of the jetliner, fondly remembers those early days that held such promise. Mr. Floyd, I'd like to read to you from a book called Ideas in Exile, which was written by Dr. J.J. J. Brown and published in Canada in 1967 by McClellan and Stewart. He says, the jetliner is without a doubt the major fiasco in the whole sweep of the history of Canadian technology. The decision to abandon the aircraft cost us billions of dollars in export earnings as well as incalculable world prestige. I'd like to point out he's talking about 1967 billions of dollars. And he's talking about your airplane. Would you tell us how the jetliner came about? How did it happen in Canada in the first place? Uh, you have to go back to the end of World War II, to the fall of 45. Uh, by the end of the war, um, jet engines were being used in fighter aircraft to increase their speed, and they were finding that these engines were also very reliable, and maintenance on them was very low. And at the same time, the airlines were having to uh, look at, the, do the planning for the re-equipment of the transport fleets because they had not been able to do that during the war. And it was felt that if the, uh, the high speed that would be possible with the jet engines could be combined with the uh, quiet cabin and um, lack of vibration in the cabin and the safer fuels associated with the jet engine, that this might be a very good step forward in the development of transport aircraft. So this was the reason for the general interest in jet transports at that time. Avro's chief test pilot was Captain Don Rogers, who began his flying career before World War II. He recently retired after 18 years with de Havilland Aircraft of Canada. We caught up with him in the cockpit of a Dash 7 at de Havilland's Downsview facility. What was the jetliner like as an airplane to fly? Well, from the pilot's point of view, it was a very pleasant, very nice airplane to fly, very quiet, and of course, outstanding performance with the jet engines. Um, outstanding compared to aircraft of that same era. How good an airplane was it? Oh, it was a very fine airplane. The uh, design was um, relatively conservative compared to present day standards in that it was a relatively thick wing and a straight wing rather than being swept back. But when you relate it to the uh, type of aircraft that the airlines were flying in, the DC-3s and DC-4s and so on. The performance, of course, was outstanding, and it was designed in such a way that it would be an easy and comfortable and pleasant airplane to fly, and indeed it was. The plane that Trans-Canada Airlines had specified in April of 1946 was a twin-jet 30 to 40 passenger transport with a range of 1,200 miles at speeds of 400 miles an hour. But with the design well underway in 1947, the Rolls-Royce Company of England notified Avro that the engines that TCA wanted were still classified as military engines and would not be available for the jetliner's first flight. redesigned the aircraft for four engines in the just about the middle of 47 towards the end of 47 mm -hmm. and uh, this aircraft incidentally met all of the requirements of the April 46 specification of TCA mm -hmm. but when we went back to TCA with this four engine design it was obvious that they changed their minds completely on uh, uh, using a jet transport firstly the engine that they specified now didn't exist but more important, the instrument landing systems, which they felt they required for the safety of the uh, operating a jet airplane, uh, they were being installed much more slowly than everybody expected in Canada. 
And because of that, TCA felt that they had to pile on tremendous reserve, amounts of reserve fuel. And it got to be quite ridiculous because, for instance, on the Toronto to New York flight, the amount of fuel we had to put in the aircraft was more than three times the amount of fuel we required for the actual flight. And the reserve fuel in this 40 passenger airplane amounted to the weight of about 100 passengers. So there was no way that we could comply with a, uh, a requirement like that. And in fact, they, TCA at that point bailed out. They, they um, withdrew from the project. Now, you weren't even in the air yet. No, this was 18 months before the aircraft first flew. Okay, but you did get it airborne. Well, the, the company then had to decide when TCA were out of the picture whether to go ahead with it or whether to abandon the project. And there was sufficient interest in the United States and other world airlines that, with the blessing of the Canadian government, mm -hmm. the company carried on uh, with the design, build and flight of the aircraft, which its first flu flight was um, August the 10th, 1949. With that first flight, Canada became only the second nation on Earth with a civil jet transport. Great Britain was the other with the de Havilland Comet. As the jetliner was presented to press and public, the Honorable C.D. Howe offered his congratulations. The first official flight is an epic-making event in the story of Canadian aviation. The C-102 is an aircraft conceived, designed, and developed in Canada by Canadian engineers and fabricated by Canadian workmen. Surely this is a great achievement for AV Roll Limited and for every man and woman associated with AV Roll Canada. I extend congratulations to all of you. The airlines were, had a tremendous interest in, in the jetliner and it isn't hard to see why because with the flight of the two jet transports, the de Havilland Comet, which is a long-range aeroplane in the UK, and the Avro jetliner in Canada, it was obvious that the airlines could see the writing on the wall and that one day they might have to consider the operation of uh, this kind of an aeroplane in their fleets. And so they took a tremendous amount of interest in it. And also, uh, the company obviously now had to sell to a foreign airline because there was no market in Canada for it. And uh, to do that, you had to demonstrate the aircraft. So we mounted a massive uh, marketing and demonstration program down in the United States. We took the aircraft down to all the headquarters of all the major airlines down there. And their executives and engineers and operations people and the pilots all flew in the aircraft. And it was received with a, a lot of enthusiasm there. And also, we put it on the airways. We actually did a lot of intercity flying in the, the United States with the airplanes so that the uh, traffic controllers and uh, the um, uh, certification people and everybody um, to do with aviation really learned a lot from that particular airplane. There. How did New York react when you brought that airliner in there for the first time? And it was the first arrival at New York of a jetliner. Yes, that's right. Um, well, I didn't realize that there was any big problem going on. Uh, we were doing a triangular demonstration flight from Toronto to Chicago to New York and back to Toronto. And um, I didn't know there was a problem, but while I was flying the airplane between Chicago and New York, our representative in New York was having a terrible argument with the chief control tower operator at New York to bring the uh, jet transport in there because he was concerned that the jet was going to burn the runways and burn up the terminal building and damage other airplanes and all this sort of thing and he didn't even want it to land in New York. Um, fortunately before we actually got into the New York area permission had been obtained to do the landing but we were only supposed to land it, stop the airplane out on the runway and get it towed into the terminal building so that it wouldn't be doing any damage to the other airplanes or the terminal. Is they were just really worried about this fire spitting airplane that was going to come into their airport. Did they question you when you said that, well, here we are, EJD coming from Toronto at 30,000 feet? Oh, yes. Um, the air traffic controllers at the reporting stations en route, of course, weren't accustomed to um, transport aircraft at these high altitudes and high speeds. Yeah. So they would very often question us if we'd made a mistake, if we said 30,000 feet, did we mean to say 3,000 feet? Or mm -hmm. if we gave our estimate to the next... Uh, just the next checkpoint, uh, they would ask us to recheck our time, that we must be wrong on the time. So it was, it was kind of fun. The record 
books of commercial aviation need some revising tonight. They've been shot to pieces by the performance of the Canadian-built Avro jetliner. The jetliner went on an international jaunt of 1,570 miles today, and a trail of broken records dotted her route. She broke the speed records for commercial-type planes between Toronto and Chicago, Chicago and New York, and New York and Toronto. While in the United States, she went up to 36,000 feet, a new American record for transport. And she reached a ground speed of 520 miles an hour, still another record for the United States. The commercial flying time along the air routes from Toronto to Chicago, on to New York, and back to Toronto, was practically cut in two on the jetliner's trailblazing flight. The United States Air Force were very interested in the jetliner, and their idea was to use it as a flying classroom for the crews who were being trained, the pilots and uh, navigators and radio operators, for the new jet bombers that were coming along at that time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, after a six-day evaluation at Wright Field, when they requested us to take the aircraft down there, and they bashed it around for six days, they actually allocated funds for 20 military jetliners there. So there was a tremendous amount of interest uh, from the airlines and one airline that uh, put its name to paper and given us a letter of intent uh, for four jetliners, civil jetliners, with an option on another six. And so by the end of 1950 everything was looking very rosy on the jetliner but then an astonishing thing happened. C.D. Howe at that time was God so far as the aircraft industry was concerned. You couldn't design an airplane, you couldn't build an airplane, you couldn't operate an airplane, you couldn't even breathe an airplane, unless you checked with C.D. Howe first. And when uh, we came, the, the company showed him the letter of intent from National Airlines to actually, you know, go and build these airplanes, mm -hmm. uh, he said, no way. And the reason that he gave was that the Korean War had broken out in mid-50, uh, it was escalating. Avro were heavily committed on the CF-100 all-weather fighter for the RCAF, and he felt that the company should not uh, spend any time at all messing around, as he said, with these civil airplanes, uh, because it would take away the concentration of effort on the CF-100. So, in fact, he closed, he closed the program down. And we had to go back to National Airlines and tell them there was nothing, nothing we could do about you it. It was just a kiss of death on the oh. jet line. In your opinion, Mr. Floyd, could the company have maintained its program with the military airplanes on one side of the factory and the civilian airplanes over on the other side? Could that have been done? It, absolutely no problem at all. Every, every aircraft manufacturer worth anything does that anyway. Sure. Yeah. You know, every, every, almost every one you can think of develop civil and military aircraft because there's some carryover from one to the of other. Course. There isn't any doubt about that. Jim, tell and me we, this. Were, we only had 10% in any case of our total effort on the jetliner in the company. So it would, would have made virtually no difference. And yeah. also remember that the USAF were interested in it as a military airplane. So the whole thing just yeah. didn't ring, ring true to me. When the jetliner um, sales program finally sort of uh, fell through or slowed down to a stop, uh, we still had a very serviceable airplane on the jetliner, and we were developing the um, rocket system and the guns and the canopy ejection and the ejection seats and so on for the uh, CF-100 at that time, and of course the jetliner could get right up there and fly alongside. And it made a very fine photographic platform and observation platform for our engineering department because the engineers would go along in the aircraft and we'd fly alongside and they'd eject a canopy or eject a seat or fire their rockets and so on and this was very useful from that point of view but of course this isn't what the jetliner was designed for you have to take your mind back 35 36 years ago halfway back to the wright brothers and the string and paper period and only six years after the battle of britain when the fastest of the military fighters which was the spitfire and the hurricane had a top speed flat out of less than the cruising speed of this huge airplane with its 10-foot diameter fuselage and weighing 10 times the weight of the fighter. And the specification on the jetliner was for cruising at 430 miles an hour. In the, early in its flight testing, we achieved 500 miles an hour. And this was the biggest single step in speed on this continent on transport aircraft at any time, before or since. The biggest jump in The biggest jump in, in performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but at the same time as making it a fast airplane, because at that time runways were only a fraction of the length that they are today, we also had to give it almost STOL 
or a short uh, takeoff and landing mm. characteristics and make it a very docile aeroplane in the low speed end. We had to land and take off and land this aeroplane in less than 4,000 feet. And on several occasions, Don Rogers, who was the captain of the aeroplane, has landed the jetliner in less than 1,000 feet. But I think the main special thing about it was that all this was being achieved at a time when jet transport technology didn't exist at all, and it was being done by the blood, toil and sweat and endeavours of Canadians. Thank mm -hmm. you.